Coleman Hughes goes on The View to talk to the brilliant ladies of The View about race. Stop it. Get some help. Why subject ourselves to the sound of nails on a chalkboard, which is what emits every time these women open their mouth? Well, Sonny Hostin told two lies that Coleman Hughes was not able to fact check in real time. So today, I'll set the record straight on Indie Thinker. Welcome to Indie Thinker. My name is Reed Uberman, and today on the show, I'm going to try to do what we do every day, which is to take over the world. No, which is to bridge the gap between faith and reason. Uh, before I jump into that, I want to make sure that you know that this show has some amazing sponsors that you can access down in the description of this podcast. You can find uh, Herbal Alchemy, which is a great all-natural way to kick woke out of your bathroom and out of your kitchen. And then you'll also find that we have a brand new sponsor that can help you refinance your home or help you purchase a brand new home and in any event, help you secure your family's financial future. We highly encourage you to check out those guys because they're great friends of the show and they can help you a lot. Your money is better spent on these companies that share your values than any other place. But then also want to encourage you to check out the link that's on the screen where you can see our sponsors, but also sign up for our newsletter. That's the place for Indie Thinker Extras, where you can see our brand new full trailer to our documentary, uh, Fatherless, and you can help support that film and support this show. If you believe that eradicating fatherlessness is important or really just supporting critical thinking is good for society and you feel like this show has been beneficial in that way to you personally and can be so to others, then we highly encourage you to help support this show with your tax deductible gifts. Steven Pinker wrote the book Better Angels and instantly became a household name. And that is because Steven Pinker's book is about the fact that even in the midst of all the polarization and all the negativity and the 24-hour news cycle and all the things that are going on in society today uh, that are truly bad, uh, we must recognize that presently we are situated in the most prosperous time in human history, that our generation is doing better than every single generation that has ever come before it on the face of the earth. Steven Pinker is right about this from a material standpoint. Uh, democracy is being spread further than it ever has. America is uh, in part uh, to credit for that. But then America has also been responsible for helping end uh, hunger higher than any other time and ending poverty higher than any other time. Of course, not just America, but America has been a large part of that. And it's one of the reasons this country is great. So we are on a materialistic level doing fantastic. However, it's undeniable that we're deeply spiritually broken. Um, and it seems as though as we become more materially dependent, we become less spiritually dependent. And I can give you a small anecdote about this. Uh, for all of our prosperity, we are now creating suffering in the present because our lives are so easy. I think that that's essentially what transgenderism is. It is, it is importing suffering into our life and difficulty into our life so that we have something to solve. Indeed, this is why uh, the question of theodicy exists and why suffering happens in the world and God can exist. God allows suffering in the world because there is a sense in which we derive purpose from overcoming suffering. And because we know this deep down in our souls, many of us who are living prosperous, sheltered lives have to create suffering. And that's what transgenderism is. It is the creation of a problem that doesn't really exist. Now I'm a man trapped in a woman's body. Well, how in the world could we possibly know what it feels like to be a man or what it feels like to be a woman? To date, I can't ever say that I've had the feeling of a woman because what would that look like exactly? I have the feelings of a man because I am a man and that's all there is to it. Suffice to say, all of the transgender ideology is predicated upon, I think, a very simple idea that we need meaning in this world. And if we cannot find it because we've rejected the traditional means by which we found meaning, which is religious institutions, spirituality, pursuing God, knowing Jesus, if we can't find it there, then we will try to find it other places. Now, I can also give you a very significant and rational analysis of how broken we are on a spiritual level because we may be doing great materially, but race relations is perhaps one of the most horrible things about our present time. And we were doing quite well in this area all up until 2013. I'll put on the screen now for you a Gallup poll that shows that in 2013, 
race relations in America took a nosedive. Now, there may be a couple of different reasons for this. You might blame social media, and I, like you, don't like to blame social media for everything, but I think there's actually some really practical things to blame. First and foremost, Obama's second term happened around 2013. Uh, and Obama, to push himself into the presidency for a second term, desperately needed to run on race. And so he needed to paint Mitt Romney as a racist, and that's where you get Joe Biden saying he's gonna put you all back in chains, and all of these things. And in order to get his political power that he needed to get into office for a second term, he ginned up race, racial animosity. Uh, but then also, too, it shouldn't be glossed over that the formation of Black Lives Matter happened in 2013 as well. That's when the Michael Brown shooting took place, and that's when the false narrative of the hands up, don't shoot narrative took place. And all of that stirred up a sense in which we are not what we once thought we were, and we've been pushed back to Jim Crow era kind of style living, and black people don't have a fair shot in America. They're gonna get shot by the police every time, and you have to elect a black president because racism is so ubiquitous. All of that was created because not only of a lack of spiritual depth and the inability to see through these bald-faced lies, but also because we desperately need to fight something. We need a devil, in other words, and if we don't have the real devil to fight, we will create one wherever we can find one. And race has been one of those ways in which we've done that in the present. And so I enter into evidence the conversation that Coleman Hughes just had with the ladies of The View, who want to insist that a colorblind society is not possible because of how interminably racist we are. And so in order to fight our racism, we must also be racist in return. Uh, I know that doesn't make any sense, but we'll try to see if the ladies of The View can help it make sense at all. Check it out. Can I, I'm sorry, baby. Yeah. Can I just point out that there is a reason for that? You know, when I went to school, getting any information about anyone's race was not taught. No <coughs> history, there was no black history. None of those things were taught. And here in America, 100 years ago when I was a young woman, <laughs> That's how people saw you. That's how they judged you. So I think, it's, it, I don't want to say it's the, your youth, but I think you have a, a point, but I think you have to also take into consideration what people have lived through in order to understand why there has been such a, a, a pointing of very specific racial things. Like women couldn't go to get into colleges. If you are a black person, there are a lot of colleges wouldn't accept you. Trying to equal the playing field. I think that's what a lot of folks were, have been trying to do. I'm sure, sorry, I didn't sure. mean to cut you off. I think that's your experience and, and that's valid. You know, as a counterpoint, mm -hmm. when I was in fifth grade, we all watched Roots mm -hmm. together yeah. in, in public school. Yeah. So these are different experiences. I, yes. I think it's also different generations. Mm -hmm. It's different parts of the country, mm -hmm. right? We have very different cultures all living together in one yes. country. So I'm not going to deny that. But I think I view this notion of a colorblind society similar to the idea of a peaceful society, which is to say it's an ideal. It's a North Star. Mm -hmm. And the point is not that we're ever going to get there. We're not going to touch it. But we have to know when we're going forward and when we're going backwards. And we're going backwards when we're doing woke kindergarten in San Francisco uh, you know, with, with, you didn't hear about this story? No. All right, I love the way Coleman responds right there because he is right. What Whoopi is offering is an anecdote. And by the way, it's an anecdote based upon personal experience from 60 years ago. You can imagine some things have changed since then, and indeed they have. But they haven't changed for the better, they've changed for the worse. Because now, because of the racial narrative going on in America, we are told that the only way to fight back against the racism that we have going on in America today is to introduce small children to the 1619 Project or woke kindergarten. In other words, we must introduce them to the racially and radically divisive critical race theory, and we must introduce them to people like this. This is the founder of woke kindergarten. My name is Akia. I also go by Key. Another name that I like for people to call me is Kia. When I was teaching kindergarten in my classroom, I used to go by Miss Akia. And sometimes I went by Miss Gross. If any of those names feel good to you, you can refer to me by any of those names. But it's important that I tell you that my pronouns are they, them. And I am 
100% 10 toes down anti-Israel. I believe Israel has no right to exist. I believe the United States has no right to exist. I believe every settler colony who has committed genocide against native peoples, against indigenous people, has no right to exist. So you try to square for me that uh, square circle, if you can, uh, of how teaching children gendered pronouns and teaching children that Israel shouldn't exist. So teaching them gender ideology and teaching them anti-Semitism somehow is going to help us all achieve some race, some racial utopia. Uh, forgive me if I don't think that we've actually gone in the reverse and we've actually become retrogressive, um, which is what progressivism actually leads to. You gotta do so much um, and you have to always be moving that it doesn't even matter if you're moving backwards. This is essentially what the progressive movement does. And they've pushed us backwards in terms of our racial conversation, um, probably back to about the time of Whoopi, but now things are absolutely uh, the opposite. The only kind of racism that is tolerated in society today, by and large, is racism against white people. Uh, and that's perfectly acceptable because somehow if you're white, you can't be racist because you have power and such, some such nonsense. In other words, I would just say this, for Whoopi's anecdote and for whatever we could say about the way things were in the past, we are not that but we're not better, but not because we're what we were back then, but because we've gone in the wrong direction. And perhaps colorblindness might be an issue that needs to be readdressed so that we can actually make some real progress so that we can quit looking at people based upon race. But The View ain't having that, as you'll see in this next clip. I have a question, because you write that the anti-racism movement, there are a couple of People, I don't even who, know who they are. Maybe you Robin know. D'Angelo. Robin D'Angelo, yeah. Ibram Kendi, for instance. Okay. Well, they, uh, you say that that is just a form of, another form of racism, and you even say it has a lot in common with white supremacy. How can you compare those two things? You, I you compare talk about them anti-racism. Because... You're comparing it to white supremacy. Because they they both view your race as a. a extremely significant part of who you are. So r white supremacists, they obviously say, we all know what they say, okay? Uh, Neo-racists like Rob D'Angelo, they say that to be white is to be ignorant, for example. Well, uh -huh. this is a racial stereotype, and I want to call a spade a spade and say this is not the style of anti-racism we have to be teaching our kids. We should be teaching them that your race is not a significant feature of you, who you are. Who you are is your character, your value, and your skin color doesn't say anything about that. That's, that's actually misrepresenting so, what, what Robin D'Angelo's yeah. position is. It's in her book. Here's the first big lie that Sonny Hostin tells. Of course Robin D'Angelo is one of the worst people on the planet, and of course she says that whiteness is tantamount to ignorance. So I have the receipts for you here. Uh, what I mean by that is I try to be less white in the ways in which being white is oppressive, in the ways that I have been socialized as a white person to be oblivious, to be racially ignorant, but also arrogant. I am going to faithfully paraphrase what this woman just said. Whiteness really isn't that bad. It's just oppressive, arrogant, and ignorant. I mean, she literally says, to be white is to be ignorant. Now, you can make what you want to about that, but that is, a, that is absolutely what the woman says. The whole premise, anyway, of anti-racism and white fragility is that white people in particular have an epistemic defensiveness when it comes to race. That if you tell them that we want to eradicate racism, they will say, yes, absolutely. But then when you start to tell them the ways in which they are racist, they will start to resist it. Maybe because they aren't those things that you are telling them they are. And Robin D'Angelo needs to have a little bit of a struggle session herself. Because if she is those things, that's fine. Tell the world and write a book about it. But don't try to make us like you, because in no way are we that disgustingly evil. So how about no, Scott, okay? Do we do this to black people? And the answer is no, because it would be racist. If we went to a group of black people and assumed that they were ignorant simply because they're black or that they would be immediately defensive whenever we confront them with their racism, um, all of that would be incredibly offensive uh, because it would be indeed racist, which is why we need a colorblind society. And the reason I argue for that is, is not because we shouldn't notice that a person is black or that we're trying to pretend that, what, but, uh, that they're not or that we don't see that they are, but simply that we should understand that it really doesn't matter that much that they are. 
See, I'm a biological essentialist because your biology does constitute a bit of your personality and who you are. And I share in common with a black man that biology. It doesn't matter what the color of his skin is, that biology is shared among all men regardless of race and ethnicity. So it's, that's why it's okay to be a biological essentialist, but not a racial essentialist, because skin color, as they say, is just skin deep. And we should judge people based upon the conduct of their character, not the color of their skin. Now, this is perfectly illustrated in uh, a movie that just recently ca came out, and I would highly encourage you to check it out, called American Fiction. It is this idea that, based upon the color of a man's skin, he is not allowed to be a certain, quote-unquote, kind of black man. Uh, that he must make up what is black culture, and that black culture is monolithic, which of course is absolutely racist. The only way around this is by developing a true epistemic kind of colorblindness that treats people based upon their character. And uh, we'll see one more big lie about this very thing uh, in one final clip. Thing to be addressed. That part is true, but... As you are a student of Dr. King, I'm not only a student of Dr. King, I know his daughter, Bernice, right? Mm. So I, I'm, I'm gonna get to my question. Go ahead, go right ahead. Um, I think the premise is fundamentally flawed. You, you, so rather than class, he did write about that earlier on. Right before his death, he made the argument for racial equality and racial reparations. And so your argument for color blindness, I think, is something that the right has co-opted. And so many in the black community, if I'm being honest with you, because I want to be, believe that you are being used as a pawn by the right and that you're a charlatan of sorts. He's, he's not a Republican. Well, so how do you... Who, 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 he's who never voted for well, you, 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 you said that you're a conservative. No, you, you, no. No, you did. You actually said that uh, <coughs> in the podcast that you did two weeks ago. I said I was a conservative. He's not, yes, he's not, yes, you did. So, but my question, to you, my question to you is, how do you respond yeah. to those critics? Okay, let's let give him okay, so an answer. Yes. First yes. thing I want to... I think it's very important. The quote that you just pointed out about doing something special for the Negro. That's yes. from the book, Why We Can't Wait, that I, that I just mentioned. Yes. A couple paragraphs later, he lays out exactly what that something special was, yes. and it was the Bill of Rights for the Disadvantaged, a broad class-based po uh, policy. But he also says okay. you must include race. <clears throat> no, he didn't, he says it's yes, a- Yes, he does. Okay, well, everyone can go, everyone should go read the book, Why We Can't Wait. Let's not get sidetracked. All right, so there you have it. Sonny, on the one hand, is saying that Martin Luther King Jr., she's a student of him, by the way, um, and she knows uh, her, his daughter, so that matters. Uh, and she argues that Martin Luther King Jr. in his book, Why We Can't Wait, is absolutely calling for race-based redistributive programs. Uh, she doesn't specifically say reparations, but one can only assume she's talking about reparations. So Dr. King is talking about race-based reparations. And Coleman Hughes, on the other hand, says, no, you can see clearly from the book. Um, that that's not what he's calling for. He's just simply calling for a bill of rights for the disadvantaged, regardless of race. Now, I have the benefit of being able to quote the book for you right here so that you can determine for yourself what Dr. King was actually after. And it says this in the portion of the book where he's talking about something special for the Negro. It says, I am proposing, therefore, that just as we granted a GI Bill of Rights to war veterans, America launch a broad-based and gigantic Bill of Rights for the disadvantaged, our veterans of the long siege of denial. Such a bill could adapt almost every concession given to the returning soldier without imposing an undue burden on our economy. Right there, you see that we're not talking about billions and even hundreds of millions of dollars in whatever this program is. Uh, he goes on and he says, a bill of rights for the disadvantaged would immediately transform the conditions of Negro life. So, so there it is race specific, but let's keep going. While Negroes form the vast majority of Americans disadvantaged, there are millions of white poor who would also benefit from such a bill. The moral justification for a special measure for the Negroes is rooted in robberies inherent in the institution of slavery. Now, I'm gonna add a but here because this is kind of a but moment. Many poor whites, however, were the derivative victims of slavery. As long as labor was cheaper by the involuntary servitude of the black man, the freedom of white labor, especially in the South, was little more than a myth. 
This is very, very clear what he's saying here. He's saying that slavery disadvantaged blacks, but also it disadvantaged white people. Because if you've got cheap labor, then those kind of uneducated or not really skilled laborers in the white community, therefore don't have jobs. They're going to be pushed out by the cheap labor, of course. Does that sound like our modern immigration system at all? If you kick every Latino out of this country, then who is going to be cleaning your toilet, Donald Trump? And I say all this to set the record straight because I think it's clear that the Bill of Rights for the Disadvantaged did not just simply take into account the plight of black people, but it took into account that of every single American who might be disadvantaged. So Coleman is, of course, absolutely right. But even if he weren't right, let's grant the premise for a moment, which is always a great tactic in debate and conversation. Let's say that we as Americans should we should adopt some form of race-based reparations for, for Americans. This is all the conversation today. Well, unfortunately, most of us don't remember what happened in the 60s, but here am I to try to help you with all of that so that I can show you how much of an abysmal failure much of our race-based government programs have absolutely been failures. So here's some fun facts for you about the Great Society, specifically in the area of education. So Head Start is one of those things that was created, and Head Start has had little to no impact on parenting practices or the cognitive, social, emotional, and health outcomes of those who have participated in the Head Start program. Uh, Head Start also has had very harmful effects on the behavior and peer relations of schools. Now, listen to this, because this is staggering. Head Start has cost um, $240 billion since its inception in 1965. $240 billion have been invested in this program. And spending per pupil on K-12 education has quadrupled in real terms since 1960. But scores on the National Assessment of Education Progress have changed little since the early 1970s. And not to mention the current gap in learning between students from the highest 10% and the lowest 10% of the income distribution is roughly four years of learning, the same as it was when Johnson launched his war on poverty. So that means that for these kids um, that are in the higher percentile and the lower percentile, they're about four years apart in school. Now, the federal government uh, originates and services 90% of all student loans as a result of the Great Society. So now the government has gone into the private sector and uh, kind of grabbed a hold of these loans to try to make college more accessible to those who are disadvantaged. And what has happened? Well, since the government has taken over, college tuition at public universities has increased 213% since 1987. Americans hold more than $1.6 trillion in outstanding student loan debt, and 44% of college graduates are in jobs that do not require a college degree. Hopefully, the picture has been painted for you that if there is a solution to race, race relations and racism in society, it's not something the government is going to solve for us. They have already been in the business of trying to do this, and it doesn't work. Now, I could go on and on and give you more statistics, but I hope you will see that when you're talking about heart issues, you have to get to the heart of the issue. And I only know one thing that does, and this is something that is forgotten about King's legacy. You can say all sorts of despicable things about the man's character. You can say all sorts of despicable things about his communist ties and his theology and all of these things, but I am just simply going to tell you this, that what Martin Luther King tried to do was unify a problem and our spiritual inclinations, which is exactly what was done in the Second Great Awakening, which led to the abolition of slavery. So in other words, the, the problems that we have in society with, with, a Christian, with a Christian answer or with Christian ideas and Christian virtues. And because he did that, regardless of his other foibles, he was able to be very successful in his attempt. More successful, I would say, than the government has been in all of theirs. And so, even if you are an atheist, I would expect from you enough intellectual honesty to say, perhaps we need to start deriving some spiritual answers for whatever racial issues we have in America today. And until we do that, we will keep on fighting back and forth with each other and lying about what's going on racially in America like those on The View. And I can't help but want a better future. All right, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and comment down below if this was helpful. But most of all, 
go with God.